Good evening. I'd like to call the committee meeting to order. Would everyone please rise for the prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Heavenly Father, we call upon you this evening asking for your guidance in our decision making. Give us the wisdom to make our judgments based on the best interests of this community and the children we serve. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Ms. Jackson, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please, Ms. Foche. Mr. Campbell? Here. Mr. Egan? Here. Ms. Jackson? Here. Ms. Lee Bowman? Here. Ms. Lemoyne? Here. Ms. Dysaw? Here. Mr. England? Do you want to? Mr. England cannot be with us tonight. He had an emergency. He's in the emergency room. He's going to be okay, but he had an yeah. accident. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Long? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Mr. Warner? Here. And Ms. White? Here. Thank you, Ms. Foche. And before we go on to our agenda items, I would like to take this opportunity to wish Mr. England uh, a get well wish and Miss Cindy also. He's having some medical issues. So, um, and, and also I'd like to take a point of privilege of wishing Miss um, Rosalind White a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Rosalind. <laughs> and also, Miss Mary Lametta, our assistant superintendent. Mary, happy birthday. You welcome. <laughs> okay. Our first, uh, and many, many more to both of you. Thank you. Okay, our first item are the presentations. Um, first, we're going to do the 75th homecoming update. This is exciting. Good evening, yes, Ms. Pritchard. Good evening, everyone. Um, yesterday, we sent out a press release about Chalmette High School's upcoming 75th homecoming. We're excited to share that this will be on Friday, October 28th at the Bobby Nuss Stadium. And not only will the 2022 homecoming court be recognized, but we will also be recognizing past homecoming queens from Chalmette High, Andrew um, St. Bernard High, and Andrew Jackson. Everyone's invited to take part in that celebration and the presentation if you are a past queen. I heard. Maybe that Miss Dysart was a previous homecoming queen. Is that true? No. Oh. I was, <laughs> Excuse me. I was just a maid. Okay. <laughs> but um, both of my daughters were okay. homecoming queen. We're very excited about it, and um, our Shamut High School Alumni Association is working hard to make sure that this um, homecoming event is one of the biggest yet. And Will Schneider, assistant principal at Shamut High School, shared a message on social media this past week, and we'd like to share it with all of you as well. Hello, Shalman High School family. My name is William Schneider, one of the assistant principals here at Shalman High, also the current president of the Shalman High School Alumni Association. And as the fall weather is starting to change, we know exactly what that means. We're in the heart of football season, and we are quickly approaching homecoming here at Shalman High. And as you may or may not know, this is a big one. Shalman High School will be celebrating its 75th homecoming in October, Friday, October 28th at Bobby Nuss Stadium. The school and the association are working together to make this event as big and memorable as possible. At this year's homecoming, not only are we going to recognize our court, congratulations to those girls who were just announced, we're also going to recognize all of our past homecoming queens. And we're not just talking Shalman High School queens, we're looking for all of those queens from AJ, from St. Bernard High as well. Our homecoming coordinator has put together a Google form for those past queens to fill out. You can find it here on our Facebook page, and if you fill out that info, we'll be in touch to give you more details regarding the special pre-game recognition of our past queens. If you're unable to fill out that form, you can simply call the school and give your information that way. Attached, you will also find a list of the past Shaman High School homecoming queens. So use social media, call, tag as many people as you know to spread the word, to recognize all of our queens for this great event. We're in the process of trying to put together a list of the St. Bernard and AJ queens as well. So if you have any information regarding that, please reach out, give us a hand, tag those queens so that they can be acknowledged too. Now, following the homecoming game, the Alumni Association is going to put on an alumni social so that the past queens, court members, alumni, you can socialize and reconnect. Light refreshments will be provided. 
But in conjunction with the homecoming festivities, the Alumni Association is also doing its annual membership drive and its annual Battle of the Classes. And what better way to renew and contribute to the association than by donating $75 for the 75th homecoming at CHS? Donations of any, size, of any size are welcome. You can donate $75 to the association in the Battle of the Classes, and in that, your membership fees will be covered, and you will also receive a ticket to the game. As always, all these donations go to the association, and those funds go directly back to the school, its clubs, its organizations, and our scholarships. You can make your donations to the Shaman High Alumni Association Venmo account, and you can see that below. Upon your donation, please be sure to put your name, put the class that you graduated, and an email address so that we can continue to inform you of all things Shaman High. With your help, this can be an amazing event. Help spread the word, notify as many of our past queens as possible. Be sure to donate your $75 to the 75th homecoming cause and absolutely be sure to join us on Friday, October 28th at Bobby Nuss Stadium for Chalmette High School's 75th homecoming. Thank you for the time and as always, go Owls. <laughs> Anything else, Ms. Pritchard? No, that was it. Well, thank you very much. I have one question. How, um, do we have any, um, how, do you know the turnout of the um, Queens thus far? I do not know thus far. However, I will find out for you. Yes. And um, just a reminder, you can find all the information out for that list um, on Facebook. It's also now on Shamat High School's webpage, or if you don't have access to either of those things, if anyone is um, a previous queen, they can go ahead and call the school and we'll help them out. But I'll find out how we're doing so far. Thank you, and congratulations to all the, the homecoming court, the queen and all the, the maids of uh, 2022. Congratulations to the homecoming court at Chalmette High. Exciting time. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Um, Pritchard. <laughs> okay. Next item on the agenda is the Reading Association presentation, and with us tonight we have Ms. Tessie White. Come on up, please. And this is Ms. Marcy Fridella. Marcy Fridella. Hi, Marcy. Friday. Good evening. Okay, and as everyone knows, I'm Tessie Whitestein. Hi, how are you guys tonight? I am actually the treasurer of the Reading Association, and I'm joined here tonight by Marcy Fridella, our vice president. Uh, we want to thank you for allowing us to present tonight, and we look forward to sharing our great news with you and our upcoming <coughs> events every year. Uh, last year, our Reading Council maintained its Honor Council status once again for the Louisiana Reading Association. We wanted to share that with you guys. We're very proud of that. Um, and we'd like to thank our members of our board for allowing us to share those experiences with our teachers and our families and our students. Um, this summer, our past president, Kayla Russell, and our president, Megan Araby, were asked to present at the Louisiana Reading Association conference on using technology to build literacy skills. So we represented St. Bernard well at that event. We were very excited to share with other councils around Louisiana. And we're lucky also at that event, um, we had several LRA state winners. So Ms. Yvonne Ben won Educator of the Year, not only for our local district, but for the state. And also we have two others, Ms. Heather Morrell, Educational Administrator of the Year, not only for our local council, but for LRA, and Ms. Lexi Pritchard also won Media Award, for our local council and for state. So we submit every year our winners, and we happen to get three of them at the state as well. We're very proud of that one. Oh. The St. Bernard Reading Association has offered books I'm sorry, <laughs> has ordered books um, for every elementary school in order to participate in the Jumpstart Read for the Record. Uh, the 2022 book is Nigel and the Moon by Antoine Aidy. By participating in this event, we are supporting early literacy and making books accessible to our young readers. We will also be hosting our fall event, Reading Under the Stars, at Joseph Davies on the Read for the Record date, October 27th. Members and their families will be playing camping bingo, make s'mores, read with flashlights and tents, and watch a performance from Joseph Davies' dance team. 
If they choose, they could enter our costume contact, contest or enter a pumpkin in our decorating contest. This year, we will have a category for best themed pumpkin to go along with the Read for the Record book, Nigel and the Moon. Please preview the brochure that's in the folder in front of you. Uh, we would love for you to join our upcoming events. And a couple of other exciting announcements. Um, last year, we were proud to have 26 state young author winners from our district, and we mm. took home 13 gold first place awards. We have six um, silver second place awards and seven bronze third place awards. So we also had 108 district winners from our local young author contest, which was really super exciting. That's amazing. Uh, so this year we're working hard to maintain our membership and even increase numbers. Believe it or not, we actually have a very high uh, membership for our um, parish. It's around 100 last year, but this year we've already had 90 sign up as of today. So we would like to start increasing our membership and we really are focusing on new members and student members. So that way um, we can get our future educators involved. Also, um, Megan Araby, our president, has been in contact with Shelmet High and we are pleased to announce a few of their future educators have also joined. Great, that's great. Yes, and we're working closely with Nunez and with UNO to increase our membership for our future educators as well. So that's been exciting. Um, we, we're really looking forward to you guys um, re, you know, joining again this year. We know you guys always do. We're looking forward to a very rewarding year, and hopefully we'll see you at some of the events. But we did want to say thank you for your continued support of the Reading Association. So this year's bag from the... LRA conference says reconnecting through literacy Louisiana Re Reading Association 2022 so Miss Bernie Hambrice had these made for you guys and she wants this, us to say on behalf of our association and the Louisiana Reading Association thank you for your continued support thank you oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Take charge. That's what teachers do. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Why don't you put one right here? Okay. Thank you. That's good. No. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all so much for your time. Okay. We hope to see One you soon. Okay. okay. On behalf of the board, on behalf of the board, we, Ms. Foto, you got one? Yeah. Okay. On behalf of the board, we want to thank you for the, for the gift and thanks. Tell Bernie and Bryce we said thank you to also. And um, we want to thank you for all that you do to help li with literacy and with the Reading Association. And um, I'm sure. Uh, everyone here will probably join or rejoin and so um, also congratulations to all of our, our winners statewide and locally and especially to all the students 108 of them that is yes. awesome that is wonderful I'd love to see the list if yes. maybe you could share that with us yes I could get that list for you and of the, the the students names and last year we did a an award ceremony and we presented all the we did our drive up award ceremony We're hoping to go back face to face this Good. year because it, we, we've always enjoyed our face to face events so okay. but I, I can get you guys a list of that we'd appreciate that if you could right. send it to Angie yes. and then she could just you know email yeah, exactly. us with those names Love congratulations it. to all of them mm -hmm. and congratulations to Miss Yvonne Ben Miss Heather Morrell and Le our Lexi Pritchard and um, congratulations we you know we talk about how wonderful our people and our educators are here and paraprofessionals and personnel but you know we have so many state winners it's it's wonderful that um, they're being recognized not only locally but by the state so congratulations to all our state winners also and thank you all for being with St. Bernard Parish we are blessed and 
all the work that y'all do on behalf of the Reading Association. We thank you right, very and the, much. Those teachers too, Miss Di Dyson, they, they um, you know, they're, they're the ones helping those kids to do those writings and everything. So we, we appreciate it. We appreciate everything they do to make sure that we get those writings submitted. So I know it's a big ordeal every year, but mm -hmm. they really do turn out and make sure we get the best of the best. And we shine every year at the state because of that. So That's Thank awesome. It shows our educators are wonderful, yes. and we appreciate their extra time and efforts mm -hmm. with the, um, the the writings also. Ms. Lemoyne? Thank you, Ms. Dysart. I just, again, thank you to the Reading Association, and I wanted to thank you all for <coughs> inviting all of the, the Nunez pre-educators to be a part of the association. It gives them such a great opportunity for professional development, you know, within our school district, um, but also some great fellowship with other educators. And again, thank you for all that you all are doing outside of the classroom and in the community. I know for the last two years, you all have made a concerted effort at part of your meetings to collect non-perishable food items for the food banks in our community. So you all have been so generous with us at the college for our food pantry. I know with the community center of St. Bernard as well. So thank you all for you know, all that you do within the classroom, but also the community. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? OK, thanks again tonight for, for coming tonight and all, and all your good works. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have Red Ribbon Week, and with us we have Mr. Charles Kassar. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Once again, a privilege to bring the 29th Red Ribbon Experience. 29 years, you guys. This is the 29th, and maybe the theme just hits the nail on the head, gratitude. The gratitude of this community, the gratitude of people one to another, the very reason that St. Bernard is what it is to so, many, to so many people is the community and the connection. And it is so important that we are able to impart that to our students, that our young people live in harmony and in gratitude to one another. And you guys, it's part of the journey of what we need to do as educators, as community leaders. And our, our theme, that has been set in motion by Ms. Voce and you guys and Lexi of gratitude is kind of our original work. What you see, and I have the privilege of celebrating with you guys tonight, um, Ms. Sarah Fidella Felt. Sarah is not just the art teacher at uh, Davies Elementary, but she is part of our amazing team of collaborators who create and make and with the things we do, it doesn't just happen. She's part of that process and I wanted to be able to do a real shout out to her because she represents so many who works with me. Does that make sense? And we are a team. And the banner that you see in back of you guys is her work. Obviously, all of that that you've seen that Lexi and Ms. Voce have worked on with the quality report and so on, She's been the visualist to make that come to life. And I wanted that to be part of our Red Ribbon experience so that the theme is so very important, one. But then secondly, that it's modern. It's right now. You know, visuals are contemporary to young people. And we need to say it contemporarily. Which brings me to the point of this whole journey of bringing a message to kids about being responsible in their decision making. It is so important that we bring that message, not in a dreary way, because the world is already dreary enough for kids. But instead, that message need to be, needs to be brought with enthusiasm, hope, joy, and a convincing spirit that what we're saying is this. We want to give you facts. We want to give you real information, not fear. To give you facts, so that as young people, you can make your own decisions. And those decisions hopefully will bring you to success rather than to failure. So that's, that's the rumbling theme, you guys, of the whole journey for this particular school year. We will be doing um, rallies at the Cultural Arts Building for our 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th grade students. So we've got a lot to do in a short amount of time to incorporate this message in a fun and uplifting fashion, and at the same time, to continue to bring the message of, and 
I've been very privileged to have some volunteer community people that are working with us, Mr. V.J. Dotry being one of them. And when we did Too Good for Drugs at Chalmette last year, right after the tornado, no less, V.J. was able to help, I think, bring before our ninth graders at that point. He said, you know, I've been trained as an attorney to think logically. We all make mistakes. We do things that are right and wrong sometimes. But the important thing is to give you real fact, realizing that as adults, you're going to make decisions, and we want to help you to make those right decisions. And that's the journey, you guys. From our kindergartners, K through 5 is doing second step. And second step is an emotional, social program to help kids learn how to get along. Imagine that getting along, behaving, being uplifting, uh, setting goals and wanting to do good things. And we roll that right into the middle school for sixth, seventh, and eighth. And then at the, tenth, the ninth and tenth grade level, we're doing too good for drugs with a team of motivational speakers that tie into that. So it's a pretty aggressive uh, journey between now and the end of the school year. But uh, kids, kids are not stupid today. Kids realize what we're saying is true. Does that make sense? You hear what I said? Kids are realizing what we say is true. You ask kids, how many of you know someone whose lives is in crisis because of substance abuse? You see 75% of the hands go up. So it's very real, you guys. I'll leave you with this. If we don't get this right, everything else we do doesn't matter. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. You know, those of you who've come to our shows, those of you who've gone to see some of Barry's works, Sarah's hand is in all of that creatively. And you know, you guys, as a, an ad for the other side of what I do every day, helping young people who are artists, it is so important for those kids to discover that and work in that because it's the journey. It's, it's what makes healthy people who have what we've got. When you've got that art thing going on, you've got to work with it, because if not, it's going to kill you. You know what I mean? So it's so important. It's a power. It's a powerful thing. So love this girl. Appreciate the whole team of people I get to work with you guys. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kassar and Ms. Feld, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you so much for your presentation and all the hard work that you do for this program and Ms. Felt, we've heard you're a wonderful teacher besides your, your regular job as a teacher but also helping out with all of our special programs. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. And Mr. Kassor, you also, you always do a great job and we appreciate what you do every day. Thank you. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Next item, and thanks again for coming tonight. Next item is the recognition of receipt of the Government Finance Officers Association and the Association of School Business Officials. Awards for Excellence in Financial Reporting. And with us tonight, we have Mr. David Fernandez. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, in your package, you have the notification that we received both these awards again. Uh, as Mr. Kassar said, it's the 29th Red Ribbon Week. It's also the 29th year that we've been awarded these awards. And uh, we feel it's a great accomplishment and it's a testament to the board's fiscal transparency and full disclosure of our financial operations in our annual financial reports that we publish. Um, and it goes hand in hand, and I'm equally proud of the 29 plus years that we've had clean audits because that is another testament to the school system's fiscal responsibility, the board's responsibility in overseeing the financial functions of the school system and prove to the public that we responsibly handle the finances of the district. So it's a team effort of an entire business department, and I wanted to recognize we have a couple of the members of the department here tonight. Awesome. Uh, Michael Morrell, who you'll talk to in a few minutes about who runs our food services department, 
and probably the most important member of the business department, many people would say, Brenda Brown. <laughs> <laughs> she won't come out here, but she's hiding on the side, but many people will say she's the most important because she is the payroll department for the school system um, and handles the and payroll for the entire 950 uh, employee base twice a month. So all the efforts <laughs> of them and the other members of the business department come together to accomplish these uh, awards and these honors. So I just want to recognize them as well. But thank you for your recognition tonight. Mr. Fernandez, thank you. And um, in, the, in this award, it says the Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. St. Bernard Parish School Board, Louisiana, for its annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. And there's also a certificate, and we usually get a plaque too, right, Mr. Fernandez? Yes, that we'll comes later down the line. We'll deliver a plaque at a later time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and it's a certificate of excellence in financial reporting to the St. Bernard Parish School Board for its annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year ending June 30th. 2021 and the district report meets the criteria established for the ASBO and the National Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. Well, I just want to, um, on behalf of the board, Mr. Fernandez, thank you and your entire staff for all the hard work that y'all do. We appreciate it. We know that it's not just, um, just for the, the, the our large it, over $80 million budget that, that we are the stewards of the of taxpayers' money for, but it's each and every one, individual school. They all have, have to report, you know, everything they purchase, everything they, um, it's, 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 it's a lot more extensive than, you know, just the things that happen here in central office, but you do an excellent job, and so does um, Mr. Morrell, Ms. Brown, and the rest of your staff. Thank you so much for all your hard work. And um, you know, it does show that we are good stewards of the taxpayers' money and we are transparent. And if you would, if you can just um, uh, talk a, a minute about what we go through when the legislative auditors come, and well, our auditors, not legislative auditors, mm -hmm. but the auditors come and they do a, a complete audit. Mr. Fernandez, if you would explain. Uh, yeah. well, it's that, not an easy award to receive, and this is, this is great that, you know, um, now 29 years, it's wonderful, but if you would explain what goes on with, with the audit and right. how long they're here for and, and how they delve into the books. Correct. We go through an annual audit every year, required by law and by federal mandate as well. We go through an extensive audit every year, and every year the standards get more and more stringent, and the auditors look more and more closely and delve more into uh, the financial records. And not just that, the internal controls, uh, how we prevent fraud, how we uh, how we handle our assets, how we preserve our assets and safekeeping of our assets and that. And they come and they do a very extensive review. And at the same time, they do what's called a single audit, which is a separate audit of our federal funds because that's required by the federal government, which they take the funds which we will get tens of millions of dollars every year in federal funds and they will focus on those expenditures as well and do testing as that as well. So it's a very extensive process and we've been very fortunate for, as I said, the last 30 years to perform very well. We've had no findings, we've had no question costs, we've had clean audits every year. So we do a very good job, if I can brag on my department and my staff, in being very open and transparent and uh, very responsible with the finances of the school system. And it's also a testament to the board and the policies that you pass that uh, require us to do that. But uh, that's it. Yeah. Ms. Goche? Yeah. Just, just adding to it, because I know uh, Mr. Fernandez can be very modest at times. So. <laughs> And most of the time, actually. Um, 
When we go through an extensive audit each year, for example, right now the auditors are in the building for the fiscal year that just ended June of 2022. These are outside auditors from reputable accounting firms. They're also auditing through the Legislative Auditor's Office agreed upon procedures. We go through federal audits and compliance monitoring just constantly all year round. Well, they will then come out and um, Mr. Fernandez and his department puts together a uh, comprehensive document which exceeds, what, 150 pages, 200? It's, it's over 200 pages. It's over 200 pages at this point because you have to adhere to all of the GASB um, bulletins, the generally accepted accounting principles uh, that are recognized nationwide. And that document that we put together is over a 200 page document outlining, outlining all of the funds received, all of the expenditures. They go through our bid documents to make sure everything was properly done. Um, it's very, very, very extensive. And as Mr. Fernandez said, for the past 29 years that we've been involved in doing this, which is almost unheard of in governmental accounting. We have never had a question cost. We have never had an incident to repay any funds to any agency whatsoever. We have never had not even a management letter with suggestions for improvement over um, internal controls. And when I talk, when the auditors do the exit, uh, the exit interviews with us each year, they, they are amazed in that year after year, they can't find anything that we have done, and not even an adjusting entry to go back and fix. So these, this 200 page document then that we put together that is fully audited, then we follow the guidelines set up by the um, GFOA and ASBO International to actually produce that and put it into the public arena so that it's all transparently, it's all transparent out there. So that document tells the community if you go through where every dollar comes from, where every dollar goes, and what these awards for that we're looking at tonight are for excellence in reporting to the community these operations and how they've been done. So it's really a two-step process. The audit is done by independent certified public accountings and some of the major firms in, in the metro area. Legislative auditor has a part in it. Uh, federal compliance monitors and auditors have parts of it. Once that is done and they find out, as we have had in 29 years, not one question cost, then we produce the document, we put it out there for the public view and those documents that we produce for the public view garner these awards for their complete transparency and presentation to the business community and to the community members at hand. So it's a very, very lengthy and exhaustive process. Not only do we have that 80 plus million dollar general fund budget and tens of millions of federal funds coming through, we have just we're just wrapping up, you know, a 17 year process with FEMA, where over a half a billion dollars has run through this school system of FEMA monies. And we were held up as an example of one of the local entities that did everything the right way with FEMA dollars. We did not have one questioned dollar in the entire half a billion dollar operation as we rebuilt schools, as we um, used the funds to replace instructional materials for our students. So under the leadership of this board, the financial operation of this school system has been pristine and above reproach and has been audited by every agency there is to audit <laughs> people. It seems like we're constantly under that. So I just want to, you know, uh, applaud Mr. Fernandez and the business crew into another job well done this year. And at our, re at our actual meeting, we should have the results of this current year's audit. And we'll go through that process again. They'll be completing it 
as we speak um, in another two weeks or so, that document will be produced and we'll be going through that same process for this year as well. Um, so it's an ongoing, and, and I think too, under, under the leadership of this board, what people have to understand with all of the monies that have come through us, especially with the rebuilding with FEMA, and what y'all had done, and this was another thing that we garnered, I think, praise from from the um, feds when they came in and they looked at the FEMA dollars and such, we not only were able to rebuild or build all of the new schools that we have done and refurbish the um, existing ones that could have been remodeled, uh, we also still had to pay debt off on the buildings we had prior to Katrina, just like if you had a home and that was destroyed, you still had a mortgage on it and you still had to pay your mortgage off while you rebuilt your home. Well, the same thing was true with the school system. We had to rebuild schools, but pay off existing bonds for prior building projects. And what this, you know, what this board had done in conjunction with all of us working together is to build all of these schools and facilities and replenish it without having to go to the taxpayers at all for any increase in local revenues. And then with that, we're able to say, okay, we've got all these new facilities. How do we maintain them? What plan? And with the advanced planning that we've been doing the last 15 years is that we now have we repurposed some of the debt service, as you know, the debt service millage into a maintenance millage. So we now have an ongoing fund to maintain the facilities. So the planning that was done by the school board and the administration together to rebuild all of the facilities and to set up a maintenance plan that was going to be ongoing has really just now being completed and coming to fruition and with sound fiscal policy that we have been um, applauded for by all of these agencies that have um, funded these particular projects that we have had. Thank you, Ms. Voce. Mr. Long? Well, I just wanted to add my congratulations to Mr. Fernandez and his staff. Uh, uh, Ms. Voce touched on some of the points I wanted to make, but 29 years, this, that's a long time, before, during, yes, and sir. after Katrina, <laughs> and uh, it's just uh, amazing. No, no findings, no, uh, no exceptions in 29 years. Wow. Just And I have thank to you. mention that it was all started by Ms. Voce. She is the one that <laughs> applied right. for the very first Correct. award and continued for a few years before she came to the assistant superintendent. Correct. So. so thank you very much for the job you do. Are there any other questions or comments at this time? Mr. I, Warner? I, I just want to make a statement. 29 years, congratulations, Mr. Fernandez. Thank you. you know, it, and what it goes to show is that the citizens of St. Bernard Parish are getting the most bang for their buck when it comes to education in St. Bernard Parish. And I recently had the opportunity to attend uh, a Shaman High swim meet. And what an awesome facility that is. And to think that, you know, we're offering all of our second graders free swimming lessons throughout the parish. Who else does that, right? Simultaneously, Shaman High volleyball team's playing. Anybody following Shaman High's volleyball team right now? Excellent record. Top five, I think they've ranked top in the top five in the state. Simultaneously, Shaman High freshman football team's playing Jesuit. When you think about the expense that goes into that, but then also keeping track of concessions, selling tickets, reporting all that, it all has to be brought through this, through this audit. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's amazing the job that, that you do, that, you know, all of our teachers, all of our staff does to put the product out there for education that, the, that our students are getting. You know, just listen today, Red Ribbon Week, Reading Association, Academic Games, the list goes on and on and on what we do with that $80 million. And I just think that, you know, the citizens need to realize they're getting the most bang for their buck for education in St. Bernard Parish. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Warner. Anyone else? Just one more statement, and Ms. Ms. Voce, you, you mentioned um, we've not had any new taxes either in over 20 years, right, at least? Mm -hmm. How many years has it been? Was it the well, last new one? The last new one was the 19 months, which was around 2000. The what? Around 2000 was the last millage. That was the repurposing of the, the FOR millage. But prior to that, yeah. Yeah. it was around but, 2000. So 20 years. Yeah. So it's about Thank 20 you. years, right? OK. All right. Thank you very much. And then, again, on behalf of the entire board, thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Ms. Foche, we know you're at the helm also. And to all, all of the staff in the finance office, we appreciate them. And to all the schools, and, you know, they have to keep up with they, you know, what they take in, as Mr. Warner said, you know, at ball games and concessions and PTO clubs and, you know, it, it goes on and on and on. So it's a lot to maintain and, and keep track of. And, um, you know, audit is very extensive. And Mr. Fernandez, I know I ask this every year, but how many governmental associations got this award? Or do, do you know this year? I know. It's a, a, it's not given out. I think maybe very often. twenty school systems and uh, for the GFO way that's also available to parish governments. So there are some parish governments that have gotten the award as well. But a lot of well, a lot of people don't do it because it's a lot of work too. So <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, and again, thank you for all your whole staff's work too. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, next item is an education item, Ms. Lemoyne. Thank you, Ms. Dysart. Agenda item number three is a review of our district literacy plan and we have with us tonight, Dr. Christy Saltalamachia. Welcome. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I, I know most of y'all, I think I presented before, but um, I am an instructional coordinator for our district. Also, um, more importantly, the literacy coordinator, which is uh, a role that I've involved into. And it's also very close to my heart because I am a reading specialist, along with um, I also earned my doctorate in curriculum and instruction with a focus on reading and literacy. So. Starting this year, we've kind of aligned ourselves even more so. We've always been aligned with our state initiatives, but we have some new acts and re regulations that have come down that we wanted to make sure that we're giving our students the best opportunity at being successful readers as um, they grow and they learn throughout their educational career. So one thing that we have implemented last school year and we're continuing this year is that all of our teachers in kindergarten through third grade, all of our K-3 teachers are participating in the Ames Pathway Science of Reading. Along with our teachers, our administrators in elementary school are also participating in the Science of Reading. So just a little bit of um, background on that. That is 56 hours of literacy instruction in foundational reading. Um, it's a lot of coursework, but we do think it's very valuable because not only does it give our teachers an extra tool um, box to pull activities from to help their students to become lifelong readers, but also our administrators, when they're going in to help and support their teachers, they're able to use the knowledge that they're gaining from foundational literacy and from the coursework to help their teachers also. So, Along with last year's cohort, we're also uh, opening it up for our new teachers this year, and we offered it to our pre-kindergarten teachers. So 50% of our pre-kindergarten teachers, our pre-K-4 teachers, are also participating in the science of reading, which is phenomenal, because it's not something that is required according to Act 108 but it is something that they chose to do to help their students, even at the youngest age, learn how to read and start off with those phonemic awareness, those lower level reading skills. Um, along with that, we, every year we do a literacy screener that is required by um, Act 438 through the Department of Education. 
This year, in particular, we're doing, um, we were doing it two times a year. It was only required to be done once a year by the State Department. Now, with our new regulations, it's three times a year, which many years ago, when I was a reading coach at IRB Elementary, we also did it three times a year, and then the state kind of got away from it, and now we're going back to it, that it'll be in the fall, the winter, and the spring. But something that is new for our students and our teachers, which I think is wonderful, is that along, we've always been really great with parent engagement and notifying our parents, but another added layer, according to Act 520, is that we are, any students who are below level, we're meeting with their parents. And a great thing, parents or families, and we're giving the parents strategies of how to help their children become better readers. And also meeting with them, all of our schools have met with the majority of their parents already to hit the uh, ground running for any students who were below level on that literacy screener. With that being said, we'll meet again with those same parents in the winter um, and go through again, hey, this is how your child's doing, this are some things that you can do to help us, and this is what we're doing as a school. Along with those strategies for government parents, we're also implementing interventions, which we've always done intervention, but we're really laser focusing our intervention based on the science of reading. Currently, in kindergarten through second grade, we use CKLA, which is based on the science of reading. And in third through fifth grade, we use wit and wisdom. Because again, our students are learning to read in pre-kindergarten through second grade. And then when we go to third grade, we are reading to learn. So we're already readers going into third grade. What all of the research shows is that if students are not on level when they enter third grade, they really struggle throughout their academic career to catch up. So the reason for our focus, starting even with our little four-year-olds, is that we want to catch them early. And there's many things that go along with our literacy plan as a district. It's not just a plan, it's a vision. We have after-school programs that we're doing for our students who are scoring below level on the LEAPS test. We also have something called our real-time program. Real-time is a grant through the State Department that our students who are in our UIR schools are getting one-on-one -on -one tutoring with our teachers after school. And anywhere from six hours to 10 hours for a cycle. Our cycles, we have a fall cycle, a spring cycle, and a summer cycle. So it's really a great opportunity for our students and our teachers alike to get that one-on-one -on -one tutoring with the kids to really make a difference. Um, along with that, we have some new dyslexia regulations that have also come down. So in order to align ourselves to those regulations, we have went to a new edition of the literacy screener. So our State Department says you can pick which literacy screener you would like to use as a district. We were using an older version of what we call Dibbles, and now we're using a little bit of a newer version because it has more components aligned to the science of reading and also aligned with our regulations to meet our dyslexia guidelines. So something that's new for dyslexia is we've always screened our students at the end of second grade. We started the mid and then we would look throughout, you know, second grade. By we, what was required is that we screen them by the end of third, but we always did it in second, and then anybody who we didn't catch in second grade because they were new to our district, we would catch them in third grade. Well now, with our new dyslexia regulations, we're looking at kids every year from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and at any time a parent can request that we screen students for characteristics of dyslexia. But our focus as a district is to make sure we're catching them early. So this year we're gonna do it mid-year in um, first grade and then again mid-year in second grade. And that way, anybody who's not here in first grade, we're catching them up in second grade. So it really is, um, many of these initiatives coming down are really great things for our kids and our district as a whole. Because again, we know students have to be able to read to be successful in life. And that is our ultimate goal, is for them to be productive, lifelong readers and great citizens and contribution, contribute 
contributors to our district and our parish. Um, besides that, something else that we have in place for our literacy initiative is that we have in our elementary schools interventionists. And what they're focusing on, they're also focusing on that kindergarten through second grade and really what we call accelerate instruction. So they're pre-teaching what the students are going to see in their class in the upcoming weeks. So why is that important? That is important because if I am a struggling reader, the first time I hear something, I don't always get it the first time. It takes me a couple of times. So when little Johnny is getting it the first time with the interventionist, then he goes into his classroom and Miss Smith is teaching that same content a second time, he's raising his hand because guess what? He now feels confident because he's heard it before. He's had that knowledge that, hey, maybe before he really, it would take him a couple of times. So it really has been, we've done that in our summer learning program this past year and the year before last with the Accelerate approach and really have gotten some great feedback from our teachers when the kids are starting class in August they're, and they're actually able to answer the questions and feel like, hey, I feel confident in my answer because I've already saw, have seen this vocabulary word. I've seen, read this book before. So it really is an exciting time for us for literacy in our district and um, I can't say enough about how hard our teachers have been working, our students have been working and really putting their best foot forward. And one of the things with our literacy initiative, students who score below level, we are um, giving them an individual literacy plan. So the teachers have met with the parents, they went over some activities and interventions and the students stay on this plan the whole year. And every time the teacher meets, we're tracking where are they, how much have they grown, how much have they improved, and meeting with the parents and talking about, hey, what are some things you're seeing at home? Here are some things that we're seeing at school, and here are some things that you can work on. Maybe it's sight words. Maybe it's a, a specific phonemic awareness skill. Maybe it's phoneme segmentation, depending on where the student is and what level they're on. So it really is that lit individual literacy plan will follow the student throughout the year and then when we rescreen again in the fall of next year, if they're then on level, then they, we can back off on that plan a little bit. It really is a great thing. Um, and we've gotten really good feedback from our parents when the teachers are meeting with them that they really feel like, oh, this is great. I'm, I can know what to help my child with. And it's the beginning of the year. So I have all year to help my child along with their teacher. So it really has been a really great thing for our district in general. And we also have another part of our literacy plan is that, I, I don't know if any of you have checked out our website lately, but on our um, school website we have a literacy page. And we have activities for parents to do at home. And on that literacy page there is a preschool page, elementary, middle, and high school. And it's just little activities that if the parents choose to do or to have some extra things to help their child at home, um, that's on us. So check it out whenever you get a chance. Um, it really is great and I've been working on it and building it out a little at a time. Um, besides that, this year, well, in previous years before COVID, and, and that's one thing also that I'd like to talk about, a lot of the um, struggles we're seeing with students is because they were not in school for two years. So if I'm a fourth grade student and I miss two years of schooling, um, I'm struggling right now because I miss those foundational reading skills. So that's why we're really working on that approach of making sure that we're putting everything we can out there for our students. But besides our literacy page, our Elementary schools are also going back to doing math and literacy nights. Many of them have already started having them um, where the parents can come into the schools. They also, and I'm super excited about this, our middle schools are all doing a literacy week, which is so much fun for our middle school students that high reading is still important when you're in middle school because we all know that that middle school adolescent age can be a struggle sometimes with academics. So. Um, I think that's all my information I have to give you. All right. Thank you so much, You're Christy, welcome. for that comprehensive uh, presentation. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I definitely share your passion for literacy yes. and was blessed to be able to work with you in the school system as a literacy coach. So yeah. very familiar with, with the Dibble screener. Yeah. So how does this new screener compare to what was being done in the past? So what was done in the past was um, the literacy screener <coughs> that we used was um, had 
different components throughout the year. So I'll use this as an example. Um, for kindergarten, they would start out doing letter naming and first sound. So what sound do you hear in this word? What's the first sound you hear? Um, but then mid-year, they would change to phoneme segmentation, which is tell me the sounds, all the sounds you hear in a word. Now, the newer Dibbles has the same test all year. They don't, so they have four different tests for each grade level, and it stays the same throughout the year, so you really can chart growth because the test, now the cut points of where you need to be to be on level changes, it progresses up, but the assessments are the same throughout the year, that consistency. Also, because now we're looking at different grade levels for our dyslexia screener, mm -hmm. By having those different tests in every grade level, it allows us to be able to meet those standards also. Um, and then just two quick questions. Sure. So for the AIM pathways where mm -hmm. the teachers are getting the professional yeah. development, who's delivering that? So it is through Ames Institute, okay. and it is an online course. Um, along with the online component, they also have four community of practice virtual meetings per year, um, through the course. They take a pre-assessment, the teachers at the beginning, and then they take a post-assessment at the end to see their growth and their knowledge, how much knowledge they've gained also. And then the only other question I have is the um, Dibbles assessment that's being given mm -hmm. three times a year. Who's administering that? Is that the coach and the interventionists, or the, is that being no. done by the classroom So we have teacher? a Dibbles team at every school. Okay. And it just depends on the school what that looks like. So in some schools, it may be, um, the art teacher uh, or the librarian or it could be the counselor. Um, it's all certified teachers who give that assessment and they're tra I train them every year and they go in, you know, they go in and assess the kids um, throughout the year. It really, we left that up to the administrators of who they chose to pick that they felt was best suited because again, when you're given a Dibbles assessment, it, there's many things that come into play. You have to be able to listen to sounds as the student is reading. You have to be able to discriminate, is the child saying the correct sound? So sometimes um, it's who, it's all the time, it's who is best to give that assessment. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Could I yes. just make a statement? I'm mm -hmm. going to ask uh, Dr. Salta Famaggia is doing an incredible job now that she is really aligning the literacy mm -hmm. effort from pre K all the way through. Yeah. I, I just wanted to comment a little bit on the science of reading training. You know, many years uh, there's a the pendulum that swings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I know former teachers that many of you are realize that. In, now, my being a math teacher, I'm a little bit out of my element in teaching reading skills. But at some point, you know, it was a, um, you did everything by phonetics, then that pendulum swung a little bit, and you got into this whole language movement, yeah. and sight words, and all this type of, of uh, different ways maybe to teach children how to read. And as we all know, they're all individual, and some strategies work better with some kids, and others work better with others. But the latest research that has come out, and this is what we're talking about with the science of reading, is the methodology that they feel is uh, <coughs> working best for the majority of the kids. And I'm going to ask, um, you know, Christy to kind of explain that a little bit, what it is. But what's happening with it, many of the teachers who had come out of teacher prepar preparation programs through the universities were not taught mm -hmm. these particular skills in the science of reading. So right now, statewide and really throughout the country, teachers have to go back now and get the professional development mm -hmm. in this particular strategy. Correct. So that's what we talked about mm -hmm where all of our K-3 to teachers are going through that 56-hour professional development course training to make sure that their skills in this methodology is up to date. Now, we also operate our own teacher preparation program, Teach, Think, and Art. So we have to incorporate this PD, or this professional development, to get our new people that we're certifying up to date with it. And the colleges and universities are now changing their um, courses so that the 
graduates are coming out of the teacher prep programs, whether it be the college and university or the alternate certification program, such as the one that we are doing, with those, with that training in hand and that knowledge in hand. So we're in this stopgap, uh, I guess, time where we have to retrain our existing teachers. But it should be, as they're coming out of the preparation programs, they should be coming out with these skills. And if you talk just a little bit briefly about what exactly that is. Yes. So previously, years ago, like you were saying, we had whole language and that blended approach. And actually, our teachers have been using the science of reading since we adopted CKLA. And I want to say it was 2012 when we adopted that curriculum, but I might be off by a year or so, because mm -hmm. um, all the years are starting to run together. It's about 10 years ago <laughs> we did, right. Um, so they actually were doing the science of reading, but didn't necessarily have the uh, pedagogy to know what the, the terminology was for it. So when we took a pre-assessment, many of our teachers didn't realize this pedagogy goes with this, this terminology, even though they were already doing it. So now having the science of reading, they really are looking at, this is what I do. This is what my curriculum is, my tier one high quality curriculum. This is what I do every day. So it is a blended approach to teaching phonics and phonemic awareness and the progressions of reading. You know, we all know that, you know, we start with our phonemic awareness, phonics, and then it is, you know, our fluency vocabulary and our comprehension. And what I really like to stress, I've met with every, I think I have a hundred 80, 90 elementary teachers. So the first two weeks of school, I met with every teacher in our district in elementary school and went through why we're doing what we're doing, all of these initiatives that we have, all the different acts, um, and why it was important for us to really embrace this um, newer way, but yet still the same, it's really an older way, but a newer way. And really talk to them about, you know, if our students are struggling with reading comprehension, and this is the one thing that really shows you how, like, the science of reading is really built up. For students who are struggling with reading comprehension, there are many things underneath that. So many times parents will say, or teachers, or grandparents, or caregivers, I just can't comprehend. When I was in school, I just couldn't comprehend. Or students will say they can't comprehend, but there are many things underneath compre reading comprehension. So if you think of reading comprehension as the top, and then underneath all of that, there's all of these little supports, like a table would be. So is the reason that the table is weak is because the child can't read fluently? Is it because they are lacking in phonemic awareness? What is the reason? So what, I like, what I've taught the teachers is that Think of yourself as a doctor. If you bring little Johnny to the doctor and he has a fever, and the doctor says, I don't know, he just has a fever, bring him back home. And you bring him back, you bring him home. He's still got a fever. Well, you're not getting an answer of why he has a fever, right? He has to run tests, he has to run diagnostics. Same thing we do as educators. We run, in the beginning of the year, we run diagnostics, we do screeners. What is little Johnny's? reading deficit. Where is he struggling at? It's not just the comprehension. So go really pinpoint, and that is when I say our laser focus, what is little Johnny missing so we can help close that gap and then address where he is and get him back on track, okay? Because we are always going to have different individual learners, and that's really the basis of the science of reading. Really laser focus, looking at all of those little tiny individual skills, you know, one of the things that it promotes is sound boards. You know, looking at all the different sounds. You know, in fourth and fifth grade, many students struggle to pass a core phonics screener. Well, and I know y'all are not familiar with what that is, but what that is is that can students, they should be able to pass that by the end of second grade going into third grade. So where are we? And we think, oh, fourth and fifth graders, they're already readers. They are. But that doesn't mean they're lacking in skills. We still, you could be a great runner, but still have a way to improve your running, right? You could be a great swimmer, but the more you practice, the better you get. Same with reading. So if they are lacking, say, in multisyllabic words, what do we need to do as a district, as their teachers, to make them where they are, where they need to be, and that they can succeed? Okay. Questions for Christy? I have one. Diana? 
Thank you, great presentation. If you would, explain how the intervention is working time-wise with our students, please. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up. Our students in kindergarten through second grade have 210 minutes a day for reading instruction. Of that 210 minutes, 75 minutes is focused strictly on intervention. That means intervening where the students' deficits are. So that means the teacher pulling the, this group of students to her table and working with them. So let's say Carly is lacking in CVC words. She, I might have a CVC group that, and when I say CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant, that means like cat, mat, nip, Okay. <laughs> um, she's going to pull them to her table every day and she's going to work to shore up those skills. Well then she might have another group that's working on fluency. So that group might be working on what we call six minute solution where they're doing fluency passages every day. Um, besides, so when the students are not doing intervention for those 75 minutes, they're doing core instruction. That means every student has a right to grade level content. That means content that is on and even a little bit above their level. They have a right to that. Um, that is part of our standards, what we have to teach as a district. Our intervention block is based on where the student's level is. So I might have a third grader who's really on a second grade level for many reasons. Could have been out sick, could have not been in school, could have been coming from another state, whatever may be the reason. Might just be a struggling reader. Those students we're intervening with them. But besides just intervening with our struggling students, that's also a time that our teachers do some enrichment. So it's also about, even though the, a lot of our focus is on our struggling readers, those students who actually are on and above level, we need to push them too. We don't want to forget about Miss Catherine, who's in my class, who's super bright. I don't want her to get bored, so I want to make sure I have things aligned. So I'm going to pull her to my table, and maybe she's a second grader, but I'm working on fourth grade comprehension passages with her to really push her. But our intervention block is solely focused really on focusing on those students who we need to get on level. And again, like I said, we have 75 minutes a day for K through second. Third grade is 60 minutes a day. And the reason third grade is less than kindergarten through second is they have to teach science and social studies every day. Um, in order to meet the standards for our state assessment, okay? But in K to second, our standards, we are much less in comparison. So, and we really are still, remember, learning to read in K to second. So that's why. Thank you. You're and, welcome. <clears throat> excuse me, I know we also have interventionists who come into the school and pull out students, and yes. then after school we're doing interventions yes. also, correct? Yes. We are. So Could you explain we, that? Please? Sure. So the way our intervention program is set up, our teachers do interventions with their kids in our class. We also have interventionists who pull out, and those interventionists, remember, they do the accelerate approach. They're pre-teaching content that's coming up so that the students are hearing the content more than once so that they can be successful with it. Um, and then we also have after-school tutoring or intervention. Um, it really is more of a tutoring for after school. So that is our real time, which is our UIR schools that we focus on. Um, and also our after school tutoring for students who um, were not proficient for our state assessment. We offer that to them. Um, and that's also in middle school too, they have after school tutoring. Our after school tutoring starts the first week in November and it goes all the way up until state assessment. So it really is, we have many opportunities for our students um, to be given tutoring. And again, this is something that, you know, uh, for a parent who really need, wants to see their child have extra help, it really is a great thing. Thank you, and with the parent piece, um, do you, you find that the, the meetings are going well and the parents are definitely participating? Absolutely. Our parent, and I, you know, I have to give my hats off to my administrators. They really have worked hard to get our parents in, you know, to be flexible with times and schedules. I've, I was at a school the other day and they were meeting after school because a parent, you know, couldn't get there during the day because of their work schedule. Um, it's really been great. The parents feel like they're walking away with something in their hands also to help their child. Because again, remember, Many, in many instances, the first time a parent meets the teacher for academic feedback, not just for, hey, this is open house, is report card conference normally. So by getting them in early, we're hoping to prevent 
the students from struggling when it comes time for report cards. We're hoping that we're, we're getting them right out the gate. And that way to give the students the best opportunity to be able to perform on level. So yes, we've had really great feedback on it from our administrators, our teachers alike. Um, you know, and again, I'm gonna, and you know, when we first brought you start, you know, I rolled it out in the beginning of the year. It was kind of like, whoa, wait, hold off. <laughs> you know, we just starting out school, and I'm like, I know, but we need to hit the ground running. So, really, has been a great thing. I've had um, text messages teachers have sent me that are like, hey, let me tell you what happened in this meeting. Let me tell you how great this was. You know, and um, it really is, I think, feel like a great thing for our families as, you know, a parish, so. Thank you so much again uh, for all you, you do and, and for the teachers who, who yeah. go way beyond. Absolutely. And, and, um, and to our administrators also. Yeah. Uh, literacy, as we all know, is the most important, one of the most important, you know, um, devices for any child to succeed. So. Absolutely. Not devices, but you know, learn, um, teaching. So we appreciate the, the great efforts on on the literacy program, and um, thanks again to you and to all the teachers and administrators. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Christy? I have right, a question. You. I wanted to know: Do you uh, do we provide after school transportation for the students too? For tutoring after yes, school? Yes, for after school tutoring we do. They, um, you know, we have our school buses that they take and um, they go, you know, they get dropped off at their house okay. after, yes. Now our real time tutoring, which is a grant, the parents bring them and pick them up and some of the kids do it virtually if their parents uh, choose that option. That's good to know. Anything else? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lemoyne. The next item is the review of personnel changes for October 2022. Good evening, Ms. Pritchard. Good evening. After listening to all those presentations, I'm even more grateful that five of my grandchildren are in our district as students. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me excited. Um, you should have the personnel changes to review. Uh, last time we talked, I was trying to recruit, we were trying to recruit a, a counselor from Miro, and we got her. So we're very excited about that. Um, we are still looking for a middle school SPED teacher, a high school SPED teacher, ELA, and math. We have interviews going on this week for some of those positions, but we are, we are looking for those when we're always looking for bus drivers, custodians. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, Julie Gennard, yes. who is uh, retiring from the transportation yes. department, yes. and she's not only been a, a great teacher, but also a great supervisor of the transportation. So um, I just want to tell Julie, thank you for all of your hard work and many years of service and happy retirement, and you will be missed. Yes, 33 years she had. Mm -hmm. And yes. also to Melissa Collins, who was an um, elementary teacher at Lacoste for many years, and yes. I, I I had the privilege of, of my grandchildren having yes. her, and she's an excellent, excellent teacher. teacher. But yes. we thank Melissa Collins for all of her hard work and many years of service. She was excellent, and um, happy retirement to her also. Yes. Anyone else? I, I just want to chime in on you know Julie Gennard, who's been with us for 33 years. She um, you know started teaching math at uh, St. Bernard High. And believe it or not, I think she even did a stint at helping to coach the football team. She did. She did. So <laughs> Julie is a woman of many, that, many though. talents um, <laughs> when she was at St. Bernard High at that point. And then at uh, one time, she was the principal of our alternative school and then the supervisor of transportation. So she's a multi-talented uh, woman who has really devoted her career to our students and our school system and our community. And uh, she's still gonna be around and we'll call on her uh, now on a volunteer basis. Mm -hmm. um, so she's been a tremendous asset. We're sorry to see her go, but we hope that she really enjoys her retirement and has more time to spend with her family. Yes, yes. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I just wanted Before. to comment on Julie. Um, <laughs> Congratulations, well earned, well deserved. I just um, celebrated, we, we together celebrated our 40th high school reunion. And I served on a committee with Julie. And uh, she worked, like, worked me like a rented mule. 
just so you know. <laughs> but uh, hard work, and so she did all her bus transportation stuff and still pulled off, still pulled that off. a 40 year class reunion. So, congratulations to you, Julie. Yes. Anyone else? Mr. Campbell. Yeah, I'd like to echo with Julie. Yeah, I talked with her years ago. She also coached uh, volleyball mm -hmm. at uh, Lord Gardner St. Bernard. Yeah. And I wish her the best. Anyone else? Okay, just one more comment. Um, I see you uh, hired a bus driver. That's yes. good. Yes, that's always good. <laughs> that is good. That is. Keep them coming. And we need Keep more bus coming. drivers. Yes, yes. So it's they a, can apply with Ms. Bircher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bus drivers, cafeteria. And all you Thank need you. is a desire, desire to learn to drive the bus yes. because we do train people to become bus drivers and help them through their certification process yes. and helping them to acquire their CDL license to actually drive the bus. So we start you from square one and help train you. You just have to hit. Now, that I don't desire. think I could ever do it, to be honest, but uh, no. uh, you have to have that special temperament to drive a busload of students. Um, but if Definitely. you feel that you would like to do so, we will train you from square one and work with you to get you proficient and help you to get your license to drive a school bus. Thank you, Ms. Foche. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, thank Ms. Bircher, you. and all your hard work. We appreciate it. Okay, next item is a uh, finance committee item. Mr. Warner. Thank you, Mrs. Dysart. 5.1 request for permission to advertise to bid for food products period of January 1st 2023 through June 30th 2023 for class 2 3 5 6 7 8 and 9 seasonings staples canned goods frozen foods poultry and eggs meat and meat products and seafood products I believe mr. Morrell it is mr. Morrell how are you today sir I am doing well. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, yes, I'm here to ask permission to advertise and open bids uh, for food products for the period of January 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2023. I have a motion by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Long. Do we have any questions for Mr. Morrell? Me and then we have a first and a second. Please cast your vote. Motion passes 10 0. Thank you. And just a reminder uh, this week is National School Lunch Program Week. So I look forward to seeing everybody. I've, I've been getting a lot of feedback from everybody. So I look forward to seeing you for the rest of the week in the cafeterias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Next item are the superintendent's notes. Yeah, just to reiterate, and we have this listed on the agenda, again, about the audit. The, we should have the auditors here at the next board meeting. It should be complete within the next two weeks, and they'll be coming to give you their final report on, um, you know, the year ended June uh, 30th of 2022. <coughs> Um, with that as well, it's just a reminder that our students are going to be participating in the Veterans Day Parade, which is scheduled for Sunday, November 6th. And um, a reminder to everyone here and in the public, you know, after Katrina, we had done, we had started <clears throat> what we called our Day of Reflection Breakfast, which was always held on the anniversary, which was August the 29th. And what we decided to do last year was switch the date of that instead of uh, doing it on the anniversary of Katrina, we have decided to start the new tradition on doing it on the anniversary of the reopening of our schools, which was November 14th. So with this year, with the theme of gratitude, 
The day of reflection breakfast will be Monday, November 14th. It will be open to the public as well if they wish to purchase a ticket to that. And a lot of the community members and uh, people who contribute to our school system in many, many different ways attend. And it's always a nice event to come. And you see our kids and the different things that we have going on. So that's going to be Monday, November 14th, the annual day of reflection breakfast, um, 8.30 at the um, ninth grade academy on Shumut High School's campus, as we've always had it there. Um, and just a, real quick, the, you know, I was at a, a Bessie meeting today. As, as you know, I'm on the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. And we are looking at changes to the accountability system for the state of Louisiana. And we are very close to finalizing that plan. And a big part of it at the high school level is not only the uh, pathways for what we call Topps University pathway, uh, we, also are ha we also have a career and technical education pathway. And the new formula will heavily reward and recognize those students who wish to take that particular route. And we've been one of the early adopters, as you well know, with the Fast Forward program with so many of our students on those Jumpstart pathways at Nunez Community College, taking courses, some of whom take them in the general ed, the English, the math, the science, the social studies. And then we have other students who are taking advantage of all the technical courses that are being offered there in conjunction with their high school credits um, in the trades and votech tech areas. So <clears throat> finally, you know, we're hopefully going to be recognizing the accountability system for the work that we have been doing for the last several years. And in fact, I know I'll probably ask Aileen LaBeouf, who's our CTE coordinator, to come at one of our next meetings and give an update on that. But we've got 356 kids from Shalman High School this semester taking courses at Nunez Community College, um, totaling over 2,000 credit hours. That's just the fall semester. And they will be taking additional courses and then some others as well in the spring. So 356 kids at Shelmet High School are concurrently enrolled in courses at Nunez Community College this semester, either getting advanced work on a regular four-year degree, um, which means, and, and I don't know um, how many people know, but there's something that's called an articulation matrix. Uh, for colleges and universities. And in the state of Louisiana, this articulation matrix requires the colleges to accept credits from each other. So for example, if a student takes an Omega up, and Ms. Lemoyne pro can probably correct me with numbers or whatever, but I'll make it up. If you take English 101, whatever, at the at Nunez Community College, then if you transfer to LSU or Southeastern or ULL, or any college in the state, it tells you it automatically transfers as that first English course at LSU or at Southeastern. So we're giving our kids the opportunity to take those credits while they're in high school so they have a jump start on uh, the regular four-year degree. So we have many kids enrolled in English and in math and in um, Spanish, actually. and. Uh, digital media and fine arts, all of these different things that will transfer to any four-year college in the state of Louisiana. Um, some kids will get an entire semester done or a whole year done while they're still with us. And even beyond that, because we, as you remember, we have some who have gotten associate degrees um, and at graduation, I think this past year, we had four of those students who actually attained a full associate degree. And then on the flip side, with the career and technical side, we have our students enrolled in welding courses there, electrical courses, EMT, CNA, which is Certified Nursing Assistance, um, you can help me, phlebotomy, all the different 
courses that uh, they may take that they're interested in. And in fact, the Oshner Partnership, and I didn't mean to go on this long with it, I was just gonna mention it in, in relation to what we were doing today, but that partnership with Oshner Medical to do a full apprentice program um, for those students who are interested in nursing. So by the time that they would leave us, they're able to walk into jobs at Oshner, they'll have an LPN, and then if they wish to pursue the RN additionally, then they've got the jump start on that. And when you talk about that $80 million budget that we have, Mr. Warner, and all the different monies that we have, we have planned and put a great deal of that into helping these young people to get that jump start on either their college or their career, whatever their choice is, whether it's a four-year university or whether it is a career and technical area. And that's very helpful for the parents. They won't have to worry about tuition for any of those particular courses. And that gives the kids a jump start in knowing what college is like and being able to feel successful that they have completed that while they're still in high school with the support that we could provide. So 356 kids at Shelman High School are really over at Nunez this semester taking those courses. You know, they're with us part of the day and they're part of the day as well. So on the um, accountability, so you get weighted for that, and that's accountability just so we know that's, the, that's when you get ranked A, B, C yeah. school. Mm -hmm. So we ought to be an A plus. Well, I don't know. We're in A school right now, but I tell you they're toughening they're toughening the formula as we speak. So the projection is for the, first, the next couple of years, all the high schools are gonna drop down. You know, so we, we may be dropping down to a B or whatever and then working the way back up because they're putting more rigorous indicators into, um, into the formula. Some of which I agree with, some of which I do not agree with at all because you know, I think there's a fine balance there. We want high school kids to be high school kids and have a good high school experience. We want to give them a taste of what it looks like beyond that, whether it is college, career, or military, whatever they so choose. Um, but, you know, part of me says, I don't, I want them to have not only the academic experience, but the social experience that maybe we all had in high school that we enjoyed as well. So we're, we're walking that and trying to get that fine balance. You know, how much of it do we do? And what we have, we run the gamut. If we have a very committed, serious student who wants to go through and get a full associate degree, and we have them, you know, they can get 60 hours of college credit before they graduate high school and then get that associate degree. If they want, to get maybe you know 12 hours of college credit or 15 which would be the equivalent of maybe their first semester that's going to be available to them if they're trying to earn an industry-based credential in welding or electrical or certified <coughs> nursing or one of these other areas we're going to have it there and we do have it there for them and we're f much further along than most school systems because we've been doing that for several years now and um it's, it's getting more and more expensive, and one of the things that we discussed today at the Bessie meeting is when we send the MFP, which is the Minimum Foundation Program Formula, to the legislature for approval. Um, we had a public hearing on that today, and I think what we're going to be trying to do is to put more funds within the MFP for the legislature to approve for funding these programs because it will be heavily emphasized in the high school uh, program. That makes sense. So we need to get our legislators on board with that because our business and industry, uh, business partners that we, are, that we talk with all the time and who are on our advisory councils and as we create these programs in high school, they have tremendous input into what they're looking for um, as employees. Um, they're behind this initiative as well and um, we you know we want to satisfy the needs of the community in terms of workforce we want to make sure that individual student has the passion and that's what they want to do 
So I want them to have some career exploration. So let's take a course. You know, even if it's, you know, I think I'm going to be an architect or whatever, we'll take the drafting course. You know, let's take a look at some of the things that you can get a little taste of before you begin to make some of these decisions. So I think high school is a place to explore some of that. It doesn't lock them into that one pathway, but it gives them an opportunity to see if this is what I really like. Do I really want to be a nurse? You know, do I really want to be an EMT? Do I want to be um, a welder? You know, I mean, so I, those experiences are extremely valuable and they kind of get a little taste of it. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, our mission and what we need to do. And we've got to take that input from our business leaders here to see, and we do that regionally. We identify the um, different <coughs> occupations in the workforce that this particular region is looking for. And we have partnerships with the Workforce Investment Commission, the Louisiana Edge, the Economic Development Commission. They all sit on those same panels that we sit on and our CTE director does. And then, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity, I'm on the dual enrollment task force for the state and we are fashioning those programs with the partnerships with the colleges, the technical and community colleges, and the K-12. to So it's really kind of an exciting time right now, yeah. trying to mesh all that together and to plan for and secure the funding that it takes to offer these to our students. I'm, I'm approaching 60 years old and I still don't know what I want to be, so can I go back? <laughs> I, well, <laughs> can I go back and... <laughs> You know, take, I take some of them classes to explore it. I know. I, you know, I, as I guess as we mature, as we get older, I still say that prayer every night. You know, help me to, um, the Lord help me to understand what I really want to be when I grow up. And then I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm beyond growing up. But I still do that every night to just kind of pray to make sure that, um, or to ask Him to help me to make those decisions which are in the best interest. Concern. Anyone else? Just real quickly, I just want to say our first dual enrollment program started in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And I think we may have had maybe three students, three or four students who were involved and we've grown in not only the 350, over 350 students who go over to Nunez, we also have, you know, where they, they get credit credits at the high school level too when they test out and with mm -hmm. advanced placement and so you know ours equal money for the saved for the students and for the parents in the long run like you said even if they get one year or two years of college that's and they get tops um, or they don't get tops that's money for those hours at a, at a um, a four-year institution or a mm -hmm. two-year institution that they don't have to come up with later and so um, it's it's in the beauty of it all they can remain in high school and yes. still get the high school life but also get the college credits so it's it's a beautiful thing and that we it's just grown tremendously and um, mm -hmm. you know we're very fortunate here to offer that program to our students because money wise it is such a barrier for many of our families mm -hmm. I know when I when I went years ago it was a barrier for me you know I had to take loans out we had to work mm -hmm. while we went to school and those kinds of things and whatever barriers we can remove for our kids and give them the opportunity to do that while they're still in high school is what we should be doing and that's why we're so excited about that particular program so that all children in this community will have the same opportunity for that type of an education and the education that they choose and the career pathway that they choose and wish to be on. Anyone else? Ms. Lamoy. Just really quickly, I want to applaud all the Shalmet High students who are doing the dual enrollment courses with us at the college right now. Um, I get the pleasure of getting to see them each day and what they're accomplishing. And so many of them that are really going above and beyond the coursework that they're enrolled in to do things outside of that on the weekend to earn additional industry-based credentials. For example, the forklift certification. If you're uh -huh. 18 and you have your driver's license, you can register to do that. It's free to the students. And so it's just another 
um, another tool in their toolkit that helps them with employability right after high school um, because we know that high school you know that degree is important but you need some credential after that not everybody is set out to be on a, a four-year college pathway but what our students are getting in terms of exposure with industry-based credentials is tremendous so we're so proud of them and happy to have them on campus with their Shamit High Good. sweatshirts <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Lemoyne. Anyone else? Okay. There being no other business, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. There's a motion by Mr. Campbell, seconded by Mr. Egan. All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 The meeting's now adjourned. Thank you and good night.